I think one of the most frightening experiences a person would have to face would be dealing with sudden cardiac death. I know that it has happened in my family twice. Both my grandfather and my uncle died from sudden cardiac death. My uncle had just seen his doctor a week before and been given a clean bill of health. And then he passed away in his sleep from sudden cardiac death. This encore presentation, Saving a Life from Sudden Cardiac Death, features Ben and Miranda Weisbuck and details how Ben was saved from sudden cardiac death and about the foundation that they started to help others identify the gene responsible for sudden cardiac death and treatments to prevent the loss of life. I hope you enjoy today's Encore presentation. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, featuring your host, Anna Jaworski. Our program is a program designed to empower the CHD or congenital heart defect community. Our program may also help families who have children who are chronically ill by bringing information and encouragement to you in order to become an advocate for your community. Now, here is Anna Jaworski. Welcome to the third season of Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. According to the Sudden Cardiac Arrest Foundation website, Sudden Cardiac Arrest, or SCA, is a leading cause of death among adults over the age of 40 in the United States and other countries. In the United States alone, approximately 424,000 people of all ages experience EMS-assessed, out-of-hospitals, non-traumatic SCA each year, more than 1,000 a day and nine out of 10 victims dies. In fact, the number of people who die from SCA is roughly equivalent to the number of people who die from Alzheimer's disease, assault with firearms, breast cancer, cervical cancer, colorectal cancer, diabetes, HIV, house fires, motor vehicle accidents, prostate cancer, and suicides combined. SCA is a life-threatening condition, but it can be treated successfully through early intervention with cardiopulmonary resuscitation, or CPR, defibrillation, advanced cardiac life support, and mild therapeutic hypothermia. When bystanders intervene by giving CPR and using automated external defibrillators, or AEDs, before EMS arrives, four out of ten victims survive. What can cause a sudden cardiac arrest? thickening of the heart muscle, or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, heart rhythm disorders, heart valve disorders, electrocution, or disruption in the heart rhythm due to a sudden blow to the chest. The American Heart Association reports that most sudden deaths in athletes may be attributed to cardiovascular disease. Sudden cardiac death does not only happen to old people. 54% of cardiac deaths occur in high school students, and 82% of those occur with physical exertion during competition or training. According to one study done by the National Collegiate Athletic Association, there is one SCA death per 22,903 athlete participant years among students 17 to 24 years of age participating in NCAA sports. Prompt action by bystanders is often necessary due to the time it can take EMS to reach someone who has suffered an SCA. Bystanders can save a life by doing CPR or using an AED to shock a person's heart back into rhythm. Sudden cardiac arrest kills 1,000 people a day, or one person every two minutes. Not all of these deaths can be attributed to being overweight, having a congenital heart problem, or even an acquired heart problem. Some of the people who suffer SCAs are people who have faulty genes. Today's show, Saving a Life from Sudden Cardiac Death, will discuss how one survivor has lived to tell his story thanks to the action of his quick-thinking wife. Today's guests are Ben and Miranda Weisbuck. On July 4, 2010, Ben and Miranda Weisbuck were married in New Albany, Ohio, during the morning of July 18th, six hours after returning from their honeymoon, Ben suffered his first episode of sudden cardiac arrest. Miranda saved his life. Ben spent five days in a coma. In June of 2011, Miranda and Ben welcomed their son Maccabee into the world. A four-year diagnostic period followed. Through 2013, Ben suffered over 144 episodes of sudden cardiac arrest. In 2013, researchers discovered a genetic cause for Ben's disease, and a drug treatment followed. Ben inherited the mutation from his mom, who died from sudden cardiac death in 2004. Maccabee tested negative for the disease. 
In 2013, Miranda and Ben co-founded the Heart Hope Foundation, www.hearthopefoundation.org, to give others the life-saving genetic and medical care they had received. Miranda and Ben spend considerable time flying across the country raising funds for their foundation. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, Miranda. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm so excited to have you here. As some people may remember, Ben was on my show before, but this is my first time to meet you, Miranda. Great to be here. Well, I cannot imagine coming back from my honeymoon and then having to call 911 because my husband was unconscious. Can you walk us through what happened? Certainly. Well, as you mentioned, we had just returned home from our honeymoon, and it was 8 o'clock in the morning. I got dressed to go to the gym while Ben was still in bed. And I walked downstairs, made a cup of coffee, and then it occurred to me that what was I in such a big rush for? I mean, you know, this was the first day of my married life home from our honeymoon, and I thought, you know what, Miranda, the gym can wait. Go upstairs, sleep with your husband for an extra 10 minutes. And I walked upstairs, and Ben at that point had woken up, and he was sitting up in bed, and he had his Blackberry in his hand, and he was texting a client, and he looked at me, and suddenly his eyes rolled back into his head and he gasped for breath and collapsed back on the bed. I was shouting his name and completely unresponsive, so I quickly grabbed the phone that was in his hand and dialed 911. And at that point, I had no idea what was going on, and the paramedics were at our house very, very quickly. They came in, they took Ben off the bed, they used an external defibrillator to shock Ben's heart back into rhythm. They intubated him on our bedroom floor and rushed him to the hospital. And as you mentioned before, he was in a coma and receiving hypothermic treatment and all of that. Wow, that's just so much to go through. Here you are getting ready to go to the gym. Imagine if you had left. To me, I probably have played back that second decision a million times in my brain and yeah. luckily luckily I didn't go and the gym could always wait and I figured we could just spend those extra 10 minutes so I'm definitely grateful for that decision. Yes and that you were so quick thinking to grab the Blackberry and to go ahead and dial 911 that was really really brilliant so you never did CPR you were lucky enough that EMS got there so quickly that you didn't feel that you needed to do that or were you just totally in shock? I think I was I think with a combination of the two I mean I was completely in shock because here I am this you know newlywed there's my perfectly healthy husband and this mm-hmm. has just happened so I think Grabbing his phone and dialing 911 was just, it was a reflex. It was just Mm -hmm. almost autopilot. And then I watched when we were very, very fortunate that the local first responders had been responding to a false alarm in our neighborhood. So they were at our house. I was still on the phone with the 911 dispatcher when they were already in our driveway. So they were here so quickly. And luckily, there was, from him gasping for breath, there was enough oxygen in his lungs to make it for them to come and be able to start resuscitating him. Wow. I just can't even imagine going through that. But you went through even more than that because it's not uncommon when a person has a sudden cardiac arrest or when they have heart surgery to suffer some complications or to have to have extraordinary efforts made to save their life. And you mentioned that he had to be put in a hypothermic coma Can you tell me what it was like to visit your husband in the hospital who seemed so vital and otherwise healthy and then to have to see him in that condition? It's simultaneously terrifying and surreal. I mean, Mm -hmm. I went from being a newlywed that you're so happy and not a care in the world to the very distinct possibility of becoming a widow. Mm -hmm. So it's both, as I said, both terrifying and surreal to see, at that point, my husband, who is a very healthy young guy laying in a hospital in a coma, it was so surreal because you look around the ICU and you see older people, you see people, Mm -hmm. you don't see this young, vibrant guy sitting there who, quite honestly, our honeymoon was in the Caribbean, so he was still pretty tan, so he looked extraordinarily healthy laying there except for the fact that he was in a coma and had wires Mm -hmm. coming out of every direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, that must have been so unbelievably hard. Now, are you in the medical field as a professional? I, I am not. And it has been this journey with Ben has been um, an education in the medical <laughs> field. My in-laws are both physicians, which has been a mm-hmm. great resource for us. But mm-hmm. with this sort of situation with Ben, it really is true the adage that knowledge is power. And I have educated myself as well as I possibly can on everything having to do with cardiovascular health, genetics, sudden cardiac arrest, you name it, just to electrophysiology, how to read an ECG, all of these things just so that I can (laughs) be better equipped to ask questions of medical professionals to make sure that my husband is getting the very best treatment possible. Right. And you were even in the hospital while your husband experienced sepsis which is a horrible complication that can occur. Can you tell us about that? That was absolutely the most terrifying, I think, experience Mm -hmm. ever because with sepsis, you just, you don't know. It can come on so quickly like it did with Ben. I I literally watched it come on. All of a sudden, he was already in a coma and intubated, but suddenly he got a very high fever and went from being as okay as you can be in a coma to multi-organ failure within a matter of an hour. So Mm. probably the most terrifying, and it is one of those things that is so hard because it is completely out of your control, and it's pretty much out of the control of doctors as well. So you can take the most seemingly healthy healthy patient, and they can become septic, and it's just a matter of chance of how, you know, who's who's going to survive sepsis and who isn't. So what did they do? Did they administer a bunch of antibiotics, or how were they able to help his body to come out of that? They administered broad-spectrum antibiotics because at that point they weren't sure what exactly was causing the sepsis. But in addition to that, his blood pressure became like 42 over 10. Mm-hmm. So they had to give him three pressors, which for anyone who doesn't know what a presser is, it almost artificial adrenaline to push your blood pressure up and to maintain a stable blood pressure. But three pressers, as I was told then, the maximum that they can give someone to maintain life. So by the time we were at three, it was sort of fingers crossed, and thankfully Mm -hmm. they worked. Wow. Wow. So you really have had quite an education on the job training, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm very fortunate also to have a best friend who's an ICU nurse, so Three in the morning oh, phone calls to her help. are a common thing, yes. Oh, wow. That's wonderful that you have that kind of support between your in-laws and a dear friend. And your husband, he's a smart man. When he's not unconscious, you can talk to him about it, too. And I'm sure the two of you have learned so much together. And now you've even had the concern about, well, what about my son? Will he have this as well? Can you tell us about the journey that you went through to make sure that Maccabee wasn't also affected by this faulty gene? Absolutely. When all of this first occurred with Ben, and even when we had our son, it wasn't automatically evident that it was genetic because the first round of genetic testing for all the known markers didn't yield any positive results. So once they were able to determine what genetic mutation it was and that our son would have a 50-50 chance of having this, it's about the most terrifying thing as a parent because you've got Mm -hmm. this beautiful, healthy infant that you now have to find out whether or not they have this deadly mutation. And so Mm -hmm. we worked with the researchers at Ohio State University at the Davis Heart and Lung Institute, and they were able to come to our house. They made it as easy for us as possible. They were able to come to our house. They used myself as the control because they knew that the likelihood of me having this was slim to none, and Mm then used Ben to be able to test off of Ben's to see if our son had it. And thankfully, he does not have it. Mm -hmm. And that was probably the best news of any parent you can get. The best news any parent can get, that your son is perfectly healthy. Mm -hmm. So did they have to take blood from Maccabee to test it? They did, and it it was a very easy process. It was like a finger prick for a blood. So which is nice, especially, you know, he was an infant, so it's it's nice not to have to cause too much pain to your infant. So it was a small amount of blood, and they tested him, and then we had previously, when he was first born, had had him have an ECG, 
just to rule out any arrhythmia issues with, with perfectly normal. And then we had this genetic testing. Well, that doesn't sound like that was too bad. And what a huge relief it must have been for both you and Ben when the genetic testing and then also the EKG showed that he was perfectly fine. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of this information, Miranda. I can't believe it, but it's already time to go to a commercial break, but don't leave because coming up next, we'll talk to Ben about what made him decide to start his own organization to help others with his rare genetic mutation when we return to Heart to Heart with Anna. Anna Jaworski has spoken around the world at congenital heart defect events, and she is available as a keynote or guest speaker for your event. Go to hearttoheartwithanna.com to learn more about booking Anna for your event. You can also find out more about the radio program. Keep up to date with CHD resources and information about advocacy groups, as well as read Anna's weekly blog. Anna wants you to stay well-connected and participate in the CHD community. Visit hearttoheartwithanna.com today. Welcome back to our show, Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Today our topic is saving a life from sudden cardiac death, and today's guests are Ben and Miranda Weisbuck. We just finished talking with Miranda about her experience with her husband, what she had to go through with her husband and his sudden cardiac arrest, and how she went through the testing with her own son to make sure he was okay. It was really a great first segment. But now we'll turn our attention to Miranda's husband, Ben. So I want to welcome you back to Heart to Heart with Anna Ben. My longtime listeners of the show may remember Ben because he was in our fifth episode, which dealt with the role of genetics in congenital heart defects. So I'm so glad you could come back on the show, Ben. Thank you, Anna. It's great to be here, and you do wonderful work. We love your show. Oh, well, thank you. In your bio, you stated that you had over 140 episodes of sudden cardiac arrest. That is just amazing. Can you tell us what it is that your genetic mutation is so that it causes such an incredibly high number of sudden cardiac arrests without actually killing you? The genetic mutation regulates the flow of potassium across my heart cells. To give a background for people who are listening, everyone's heart has cells that beat, and the beating is caused by chemicals that flow in and out of the heart cell at a regular interval. There's different chemicals, including potassium. My heart cell seems to naturally open the channels bleeding potassium, and the genetic variant or mutation prevents that channel from closing. So essentially, I'm leaking potassium, and that causes problems. Okay. Wow. Wow. Apparently, with the first round of genetic testing you did, that wasn't picked up. So how was it they were able to determine you actually did have a genetic mutation? In 2004, as you mentioned, my mom died of this, so they tested the blood of her twin brother. It turns out there was a match between what killed my mom and what I had survived. So they were able to precisely pinpoint using modern technology, which is absolutely phenomenal. We are so lucky to live in the age that we have, and scientists and researchers and doctors are so brilliant that they were able to identify exactly out of three billion base pairs where this genetic mutation lies on the double helix. Wow. It is amazing what we can do with science and technology today that wasn't available just 20 or 25 years ago. It seems to me that you are unbelievably lucky that you had scientists who were able to pin Point, what it was that was causing that problem. Absolutely. And so is your mother's twin, is your uncle still alive? Fortunately, he is alive. He has the genetic mutation. Science is so complicated. It takes more than a genetic mutation to cause any disease, let alone this killing disease. And so there are three factors in any heart disease, three legs of the stool, for example. It's genetics, and behavioral and environmental. Within the genetic realm, 55% of all heart disease is caused by genetics. My uncle, fortunately, somehow does not have some other factors that are causing it, and that's exactly what the researchers are now doing, taking the next step to find out why my mom died at 64 years old, why I was struck down at 37 years old, and why my uncle, who has similar mutation, does not have the disease. They have identified hundreds of people in Europe now from my survival with my genetic disease, 
and they are testing these individuals to learn more about how to diagnose this type of disease in other people. Wow, that's just fascinating to me. I think it's such a miracle that you're alive, Ben. What do you attribute to the fact that you're still with us? I'm very, very lucky. I'm very, very blessed. First of all, of course, my wife was present. Second of all, I've been told that because I was in very good shape, my body could survive the trauma. I've tried to maintain a good sense of humor. I have supportive friends and family. Sometimes I've prayed. I have had access to the best doctors. The incredible work of cardiologist team, including Dr. Subert Rahman here in Ohio State, researchers like Peter Moeller, Amy Sturm, a genetic counselor, Raul Weiss, an electrophysiologist, Ralph Agostini, another electrophysiologist, Stephen Fowler out of NYU in New York, is an extraordinary surgeon, and Sylvia Priori, who is a world-leading genetic researcher and cardiologist. All of these people have come together. Other factors include frankly, our diligence to bring the best doctors together, nurses, researchers, we just Mm -hmm. didn't take no. While lying in the hospital, suffering and surviving surgeries, I maintained mantras. One of my mantras was to fly me to the moon. It was a song I sang myself Mm -hmm. that kept me from focusing on the pain. A willpower, never, ever, ever to give up. An acceptance that death might occur to me, but I had a peace of mind that I've lived a good life, and that longevity is not promised to any of us. And then a determination to make sure that my suffering had meaning to help others, that I had a purpose, and that the purpose ended up becoming the Heart Hope Foundation. And finally, the factor that has been extremely helpful is that researchers now have discovered a drug that is an orphan drug used for multiple sclerosis, which I take for heart disease, which has helped save my life and quell my heart. So all these factors, it's just been extraordinary. It's just been extraordinary. Not always fun, but not always fun, but extraordinary. No, I just think that's amazing, too, the orphan drug that helps people with MS and how that's been able to help you. That's just amazing. Well, I think that you were brought here for a purpose. And, yeah, it seems to me that what you have done with the Heart Hope Foundation is a big part of why you're still here. You still have work to do. We're not ready to lose you yet, Ben. So I'm so glad that you you. were able to bring together such a dynamic team. and. Well, thank this you. Really is the, the, quite a story. The, the, Dr. Peter Moeller is one of these geniuses, and Dr. Moeller heads up the Davis Heart and Lung Research Institute, and he came to my house and he sat me on the couch, and he said, Ben, we think we can fix you. I cried because I didn't understand at the time, and so I asked him, what happens to people without access to technology? What happens to people who don't have access to the people who don't have resources like we do to fly over the country? And frankly, he said they die. So my wife and I decided that money should not be a barrier for people to have access to genetic technology, and that's why we started the Heart Hope Foundation, which essentially does two things. It provides people with some money to access this genetic technology. And the second thing it does on the back end, we fund research in micro-grant form so that the genius, the next Einstein, who is sitting and she is waiting for funding, and this next Einstein who has the life-saving idea, she can get money to help bring that idea to the world to help save other people. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in our last segment. We need to go to a quick commercial break, but Ben, you are so inspiring, and I've really enjoyed listening to your story. I can't wait to hear what else you have to say. We'll be back in just a moment. Anna Jaworski has spoken around the world at congenital heart defect events, and she is available as a keynote or guest speaker for your event. Go to hearttoheartwithanna.com to learn more about booking Anna for your event. You can also find out more about the radio program. Keep up to date with CHD resources and information about advocacy groups, as well as read Anna's weekly blog. Anna wants you to stay well-connected and participate in the CHD community. Visit hearttoheartwithanna.com today. Welcome back to our show, Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Today we are talking with Ben and Miranda Weisbuck about the importance of genetic testing and who should be tested. And I just want to thank them so much for coming on the show. We have a chance to save a life with the show today. I mean, what Ben has been through is miraculous, but what he's doing with the Heart Hope Foundation is going to enable other people who suffer from the same genetic mutation that he does to get some relief. And I just think that's really amazing. 
amazing and a tremendous gift to humanity. So we're all in the studio together, Ben and Miranda. We're all together now. And I want to hear what is going on with the Heart Hope Foundation. It's been a year since I talked to you. So, Ben, what's going on? The Heart Hope Foundation, again, Anna, thanks for profiling us at www.hearthopefoundation.org. We have had an exceptional year. We've gone from zero to now we have nearly 3,000 Twitter followers, nearly 1,600 Facebook followers. We have our website that gets nearly 300 hits per week. We've educated in 2014 over 60,000 people of this disease, and your show has been fundamental to that, Anna. We can't thank you enough. We have raised close to $100,000. 20 families with a risk of this disease have been identified. We have ongoing partnerships with uh, Nationwide Children's Hospital, Davis Heart and Lung. We have world-class medical advisory board and board of directors, dedicated volunteers. Hundreds of people of Europe have been identified with this. We have impact in seven or eight states, multiple countries. We've had a world-class expert from Israel, Dr. Sammy Ziskin, come to Columbus, Ohio. We started a fellowship to sponsor an undergraduate research student. It's less of what we've been doing, frankly, Anna, and it's the fact that the time of genetic disease and prevention has come. Even this morning, Anna, in the New York mm-hmm. Times front page, there's an article about how everybody Everybody should have their DNA tested. In the future, what we're looking to do in 2015, our goals, we want to double our growth. We want to have impact in 20 states, impact in six foreign countries. But we need your support. We need the support of your listeners. We want to raise about $20,000. We want to give 100 tests, which is approximately $40,000 in testing. We partner with laboratories across the country, including GeneDX, a new laboratory at Harvard University. We want to empower genetic counselors who are mostly women, Anna, actually. About 80% of genetic counselors are women, and these women are on the front lines of helping people identify themselves and get over the fear of finding out, and it really is fear, finding out that they were born with something. And let me tell you, Anna, they asked me if I wanted to find out everything about my genetics, uh, risk for cancer, risk for this, risk for that. And I had that impulse of fear, and I said, yes, I do want to know, and it turned out okay. So I would give the advice to your mm-hmm. listeners, get beyond the fear. Get your genetics tested. If you need money to help pay for this genetic testing, come to the Heart Hope Foundation. We can help you. We're very excited to be able to help people and to have what we've gone through be meaningful for other people. So are the people who are most at risk for what you've gone through people who have other family members who have died from sudden cardiac death? Absolutely, and it's more than sudden cardiac death. If you have a family history, and uh, and if your listeners have a family history with diabetes, lung disease, heart disease, in many forms, not just sudden cardiac arrest, but sclerosis of the atrium, of septal defects, if you have a history, then we recommend you go and get tested. The process is simple. You go to your doctor, you ask to be tested, they either approve it or not, they'll hook you up with a genetic counselor, they take some blood, they run it to a lab, and then you have the information. And we believe firmly that more information is power. And if you need money, insurance companies don't yet cover all these tests. If you need money, the Heart Hope Foundation will be there. As I understand, the Heart Hope Foundation is the only organization in the country, if not beyond, that is subsidizing these genetic tests, and we are honored to do it. I just think it's fascinating how much we've learned just within the last five to ten years regarding genetics. And I'm sure you remember when you were on the show in 2013 that we had a leading geneticist on the show. We actually had two geneticists, but Dr. Woody Benson was one of our guests, and he is amazing with the research that he has done. Dr. Angela Shirley was also on the show, and I love how she was able to shed light on what's new in genetic counseling. I recommend anybody who is interested in genetics to go back and listen to Episode 5. It's in our archives. They were both fascinating with the way they talked about what's new in genetics, who needs genetic testing, how to get the genetic testing. And it's scary if your insurance denies you the ability to get that testing. It's nice to know that there is a foundation out there who is willing to help with that. And especially if you do have family members who have serious problems that jeopardize their quality of life. Well, yes, Anna, and the real hope for me and the real hope for my family, but the real hope for your listeners and for you is the individualized medicine component. They have literally found a drug compound used for a different disease, 
and now treat my heart. That's a hope for anybody. And going forward, given enough time, given enough money, and extending this out to infinity, it is absolutely possible to prevent these diseases forever. And as we have done in my family, our son does not have it. We are creating more children through IVF that do not have the genetic mutation. It is fundamentally possible with individualized medicine, and that's the future. The federal government, unfortunately, has reduced funding through the NIH by 11% last year. Mm-hmm. We need funding back. We need more empowerment. We need to empower researchers. We need to empower doctors. And every individual listening to this show and my voice should please go to their doctor and say, are we at risk for genetic diseases? That's what we believe. That's what we recommend. And thank you for profiling this and raising such a great awareness, Anna. You, you are a blessing and you are remarkable. Well, thank you so much, Ben. Thank you, Miranda. And unfortunately, that concludes today's episode. We will have links to Ben's website on the Heart to Heart with Anna website in the bio section. Thank you for listening today. Please come back next week on Tuesday at noon Eastern Time for a brand new episode. During the month of February, also known as Heart Month, Heart to Heart with Anna will broadcast a show every day. On Tuesdays, we'll have a brand new show featuring our theme for Season 7, Congenital Heart Defects Around the Globe. The other days will be encore presentations with a brand new intro. If you'd like to know what shows will be featured, you can check out our website at www.hearttoheartwithanna.com. Please find and like us on Facebook. Check out our Café Press Boutique. Revenue from the Café Press Boutique helps to defray the cost of this radio show. Follow our radio show on Blog Talk Radio and especially on Spreaker. Once we get to 100 followers on Spreaker, we can petition iHeartRadio to carry our show, and then people can listen to Heart to Heart with Anna in their cars. Thanks again for listening. We know that congenital heart defects touch people all over the globe. So remember, my friends, you are not alone. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you've been inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart defect community. Heart to Heart with Anna, with your host, Anna Jaworski, can be heard every Tuesday at 12 noon Eastern Time. We'll talk again next week. We'll be right back.